Jack Lemming, United States Navy, World War II. Oh my gosh, folks, what a story I have here for you. I, I met Jack in Las Vegas, Nevada, September 28th, 2007. Uh, coming up on the anniversary of that next week and uh, Jack was one of many World War II veterans I interviewed at the time for a film I produced called Lest They Be Forgotten Las Vegas. Jack was at our premiere in Las Vegas in 2008 with some of the other veterans in the film and he has a very, this is rare, this is, I don't have a story like this, from the air he flew on what were called Douglas SBDs, Dauntless, they were scout planes and dive bombers, they're, they're considered slow but dangerous. Um, they can dive almost at 90 degrees uh, towards the Japanese aircraft, whatever they're doing with their bombs. SBDs, and he was a radio man and a gunner. As you look at this aircraft, I'll show some pictures here, you see the back of that uh, the cockpit area with the, with the machine gun shooting out uh, facing the tail section of the plane. That's where Jack sat. And folks, he was at Pearl Harbor. He's one of my Pearl Harbor survivors, uh, one of the few that I was able to interview. 87 at the time I interviewed him, still very alert and told me a, ma a magnificent story of the Pearl Harbor attack and how they were in the air when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor that morning. And he tells the story in this interview, folks. This is history. Oh my gosh, I mean, my work is, is walking textbooks in history. These veterans are walking textbooks. They're encyclopedias. Jack was one of them. I, I love this man. He sets a cool picture I'll show after this introduction of him and one of his um, uh, air crew that were on the, on, on the plane. And I, I just love this man and his story that he told. He's just so relaxed and, and just matter of fact, just you'll love it. You'll, you'll absolutely love it. Uh, you, I won't give it all away right now. but. So Jack, Jack enlisted at 18 years of age into the Navy. He was uh, 18, 1937, whew, a long time ago. Uh, he passed away at the age of 93 in 2013, so we've lost him, but what a story he told. I'm so grateful, I thank God that I have his story. I wanna thank Glenn Alverd for sponsoring Jack's story today. Glenn has stepped forward, wanted to sponsor one of my stories, and this is, this is it, Glenn. A powerful story from, from Jack and thank you for making it possible for others to hear and learn about World War II and the Pearl Harbor attack which is like ancient history and to have a story like this is like a Civil War veteran coming back and telling a story so from the air what it was like when Pearl Harbor was attacked so Glenn thank you for making it possible for your support of my work and our veterans and for your love for our country God bless you sir Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like Glenn, there's information in the video description of this video. On my website, LarryCapetto.com, click on Sponsor a Vet. It'll bring up a page of veterans. You can just include their name in the sponsorship. That would be much appreciated. The video description is just below the video. As you're watching this, look, just take a moment, look below. You'll see some writing, some words. That's, that's the video description. It tells you a little bit about the video you're watching. And there's a link in there to sponsor a story. If you'd like to donate to my work, same thing. In the comment section of the video, just look, take a moment, look below the video, you'll see comments. You comment, the first comment is always mine. Just click on that link, you can help support my work through donating uh, through that link. So I would greatly appreciate it. Voices of History Radio is going strong, folks. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Listener supported, would appreciate you sharing that with our young people, with, with people driving trucks, what a time to listen, uh, commuting, home, uh, in, uh, mowing your yard, whatever you're doing like I do, you can listen to the radio station. So, Okay, that's it for now. Thank you for watching and, and sharing these videos, subscribing to this channel. We've almost got 50,000 subscribers. Let's just hit 50,000 this next couple of weeks. Okay, let's just do it. Share this video. And I appreciate all of those people out there that have helped support my work over the last few months and a couple of years I've been doing this so I'm out on the road soon again to go interview more veterans if you'd like to help support that just get a hold of me and my heart's full I, I love my veterans and a lot more I could say about that but let's get this history out there folks and, and those that are trying to erase history we say no and we're gonna keep this going and they're not gonna steal this history voices of history God bless you
basically, you were were you a pilot then? Obviously, in World War II? no, I was rear seat gunner, radioman gunner. Okay, so what what year did you go in the military? Oh, uh, I enlisted in uh, 1937. 37. The 9th of December. You went in 37, and how old were you then? 18. It was three days past my birthday, 18th birthday. So during during World War II, were, you served in the Pacific then. I served aboard the Enterprise. Do you know a guy named Jack Taylor? Um, the name sounds familiar. He's the owner of Enterprise Rent-A-Car. He was a fighter pilot on the Enterprise. Oh. You probably don't know him. No, I don't know okay. him. Okay. Okay. So you were, tell me again your, your position on, 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 the, on the, what kind of aircrafts would you be on? Um, we were flying SBDs. Um, Is that a fighter plane? No, it's a dive bomber. Um, where it started, uh, World, World War II started for us, we, we had taken some Marines to Wake Island. Um, Wake needed some defense, so we took a squadron of Marines out there. The circumstances that they went was, you know, unusual. Um, we were scheduled to go out for fleet exercises on the 28th of November. I think it was the 28th. Um, and we were going to qualify VMF 211, which was a Marine fighter squadron. Okay. So uh, at, after we joined up with the fleet and departed to, for flight operations, uh, the, the Marines had taken off and had arrived at, at the ship, and so we started uh, qualifying them for uh, carrier landings. Um, they had never landed aboard a carrier, and to um, be qualified to land aboard a carrier, they had to make five landings on a carrier to be qualified. So along about the third one, Halsey told the captain that secure from flight orders that he had just opened his orders and we were going to take the Marines to wake. So these guys had come out there in just their flight suit and in case they didn't all qualify and some of them had to remain overnight aboard ship, they just had some soap and shaving cream and things like that. So they were quite shook up about this because they had no warning. Um, so they were, we were told that we were going to take them to wake mm -hmm. and that we were not to talk about it amongst ourselves or tell anyone else where we had gone. Uh, and Halsey said, if you, you know, you violate these orders, you get a general court martial. So it, anyhow, uh, we left the fleet and, and left for Wake, uh, Wake Island. And when we neared to the island, uh, they took off and we escorted them into Wake Island. We were instructed not to fly over Wake, that when it appeared on the horizon to turn around and fly back to the ship. Now, were you at Pearl Harbor? Yes. December 7th? Yes. Could we take uh, a moment now and just talk a little okay. bit about that, the, yes. the morning and where you were, what happened? Uh, Give me the story. Uh, anyhow, uh, after we escorted VMF to 11 to uh, Wake Island, we turned around and started back to Pearl Harbor. And we were scheduled to arrive there on the 6th of December, which was my birthday. And so me and my shipmate were talking about celebrating my birthday and having a good time on Saturday, December 6th. But on the way back, we ran into some uh, rough seas and uh, one of the destroyers had to be refueled. And between the two uh, incidents, we had to slow down and our arrival in Pearl Harbor was delayed until the 7th of December. So when we got within 200 miles of 
Pearl, we were on a search mission that morning. Uh, we went on a search mission every morning and afternoon. Um, there was 18 of us uh, that flew in and we had a 90 degree sector in front of the ship and there was two planes to every 10 degrees. So um, we had uh, been ordered to maintain radio silence and not to use our radios for transmit, transmission. So it, it was about a two and a half hour trip into Pearl from the ship's position. Um, so as we neared Oahu, um, we were to land at Pearl Harbor, Fort Island. Uh, as we neared Oahu, uh, we heard, don't shoot, don't shoot, this is an American plane. And I thought, you crazy son of a bitch, you're going to get it, you know, when we get back for breaking radio silence. And a few seconds later, get out the rubber boat, we're going in. And that was the last we heard. Uh, so we continued on, and uh, as we neared Oahu, we could see smoke coming up over the island, and uh, we could also smell the spent ammunition. Um, and so I said to the pilot, uh, uh, Dale Hilton, uh, what's the Army doing holding uh, maneuvers on a Sunday for? And uh, he said, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know he said, something strange is happening. Yeah. So we continued on in, but our leg was uh, south of Oahu, where we ended our 200-mile search, we come out just north of the island of Hawaii. So we headed back. Uh, we completed our mission and headed back to Oahu. And as we neared Barber's Point, we could see three planes circling around. So we joined up with those, and uh, we used hand signals like using the Morse code to hit our head. With our fist closed, it was a dot. With our hand open, it was a dash. So uh, the rear seat men who were radio men, we could uh, converse, you know, back and forth, flying in formation. And we used to exchange information a lot that way. Um, so. I batted on my head, you know, what's happening? And they said, you know, Pearl Harbor was being attacked and they had tried to land at Fort Island and couldn't. So we joined up with them and pretty soon uh, some more guys joined up and there were seven of us circling over Pearl Harbor. And uh, when the attack by the Japanese had stopped, we started to land. So you were in the air during the whole attack? Yes. Oh my gosh, what a... Well, we lost several guys were attacked by Japanese planes and were shot down. We lost four planes to the Japanese. No, three planes to the Japanese and one from friendly fire at Hickam Field. So you, you, when did it dawn on you, you were under attack, and then what, what kind of evasive actions did you take, or did you just stay up in the air? Well, uh, our orders were to land at Fort Island, and we couldn't land. We tried to land at Fort Island, and we were subjected to friendly fire. Uh, the ships, there was a destroyer going out the channel, and as we started to land at Pearl, they were firing AA at us. And so I used a, a bright light, an Altus lamp, to give the acknowledgement for that particular hour. Uh, if, if we approached the ship, we could be challenged by a Morse code signal with a light. And uh, if we were friendly, uh, we would give a letter of the alphabet that was valid for that hour. So. The, 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 the reply for, uh, to validate that we were friendly was M, two, 
uh, dashes. So I pointed the light at the bridge of the ship and flashed it in, but they continued to fire. By this time, we were just over the top of the sugar cane, and we landed at Eva, you know, about 15 minutes later. And uh, we stayed there, and Hilton went in and to find out what we should do. And uh, we were on uh, the field about an hour. And they told us, okay, you can go over to Fort Island now. So everything had settled down, and we landed at Fort Island. But did you see the waves of Japanese planes coming in? Uh, no, uh, I didn't see any Japanese planes. Uh, I mean, you know, they, 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 they were at Hickam Field and all the other places in Pearl Harbor, and we were uh, away from them. Um, they came in from the north, and they retired to the north. So, and we were in the south. But well, now we're talking about a, 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 a major event in our history. I mean, Edward Hall, whom you know. Yeah. He told me a very detailed account of where he was and what happened. So where you were at, you didn't see all that. But did you have any idea this attack was going to come? No. So what was the thoughts of the area or of the military? The only the warning we had was the guy that uh, in the top sec search sector had hit the rendezvous point for the first wave. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that said, don't shoot. This is an American plane. And that's the only clue we had. What was going through your thoughts and what were you talking about when this was happening? This was unreal or, you know, out there? Well, uh, you know, it was a tight situation and I didn't want to talk with the pilot too much because I didn't want to divert his attention uh, because I knew something was happening, but I didn't know what, you know. Is it kind of one of those things where you don't realize it when it's happening until that's afterwards? Right. That's right. So tell me about when you got on the ground and the destruction that you saw. Um, when we got on the ground at Fort Island, I stayed with the airplane uh, so that if we were attacked again, I could fire the machine gun that was on the rear cockpit. Uh, and help one end to get some orders to find out what to do, and we were instructed to rendezvous with some planes from Pinkham Field to go bomb the Japanese fleet. So we took off and uh, we were flying, you know, uh, east of um, Ford Island and uh, where we were supposed to rendezvous with these planes from uh, Hickam Field, and they never showed up, and we were getting some AA fired at us. So our um, squadron commander had gone out, uh, had taken off and was searching off Barber's Point for some uh, sampans that were supposed to be loaded uh, with soldiers for attacking. And so Hilton called him and he told us to go back to, to Fort Island and land that he'd be there pretty quickly because he didn't see anything out there. Yeah. So we went back to Ford Island and uh, we were there for a while and there was no, out of the 18 planes that flew in, there was only nine of us that could search for the Japanese fleet off of Kaina Point. Um, when we had arrived uh, at Oahu, and um, we're circling with the executive officer of our squadron, the seven planes out there. Um, then uh, I forget what I was going to say now. Well, were there, um, I mean, when you got on the ground, though, weren't there casualties? Weren't there? Oh, yeah. When, I mean, tell me about the ships that were blown up and all. Uh, uh, I didn't get to see any ships. Okay. Um, where I, when I stayed with the airplane, waiting for Hilton to get the orders, um, guys were taking uh, stretchers by me. And 
you know, it was a continual line of guys that who hadn't been injured um, taking bodies over to the hospital. Um, and I didn't get to see any ships because I couldn't move around. I was supposed to stay with the airplane, and that's what I did. Uh, but they were still, you know, guys passing by. But you saw a lot of the wounded being taken back? Yes. What were, what's going through your mind? I mean, this was a tremendous attack. Did you realize how, how big of an attack this was? Uh, well, you, you know that somebody, you know, it's war. And uh, yeah, the impact of it just makes you f almost freeze, you know. Uh, I can't. I was surprised, but I wasn't. Because at that time, what was happening in Europe um, was, you know, on everyone's mind. And uh, we knew that something was happening, you know, because the, the war in, in, in Europe was in progress. Could you see any of the, the bombing going on down below during all this? No. Japanese? Shooting? No, there was no, no bombing while we were in the air. It had already ceased when we landed at Fort Island. But did you see smoke billowing out of these ships or the Yeah, island? yeah. So can you describe that and then what were your thoughts? I no, guess. I can't describe it. It was just black smoke coming up, you know. And uh, it was oil burning and paint on the ship and all that stuff. I don't, I didn't get around much. I stayed with the airplane and uh, that night, uh, four fighters were shot down from the ship uh, and I slept in a, on a cot in the hangar and uh, we flew back to the ship the next morning. but. It, you know, I know that it was war, and you're going to shoot to kill somebody, and they're going to be shooting to kill you, and I don't know um, how I felt about it. Was there any you recourse know. of action that we were able to take during that attack, or we just totally caught off guard? We were totally caught off guard. Um, they had uh, a radar station on the north shore of the island of Oahu that had picked up some B-17s that were coming in that morning. And uh, they had hit the guys that were operating the radar had told the officer in charge about it. But he didn't, he didn't think it was the Japanese planes. You know, so they, what happened the next day? Did we declare war on Japan? Do you uh, tell me what you heard and what you uh, well, uh, Yes, we you know, knew the next day um, the Enterprise had been, been out to sea for you know, two or three weeks. So we come in, the ship came in, wait a minute. We flew out that morning and landed aboard the ship and uh, we were there a short while and then got orders to fly back to Fort Island and the ship came in for reprovisioning and um, getting you know, ammunition and things like that. So it came in on the 8th and it left in the next morning before sunrise almost. So you were on the Enterprise? That was your that was your ship? That was the ship that we were attached to. And yeah. was that at Pearl Harbor during the attack? No. No, okay. Okay. And no, Enterprise, it was 200 miles at sea. The Enterprise is a car carrier, aircraft carrier? It was an aircraft carrier. And that's where you would land and take off from? That's right. Okay. And so, and your job on, on the plane again was what now? I was a radio man okay. and um, a machine gunner. You know, any um, any planes that attacked attacked the aircraft, uh, 
within 180 degrees of the rear cockpit, uh, I was to shoot down. Did you ever get that opportunity? I, uh, what's that? Did you ever have that opportunity to shoot down? No. Okay. Tell me again the, cra air, the type of aircraft you were on. I was. Uh, we were flying an SBD-3. SBD-3. Right. right. Okay. How many crew on that? Plane? There was a pilot and a radioman gunner in the rear seat. Two men or three? Two men. Just you and the pilot? Yeah, that's right. And a twin engine plane? How big was no, it? No, it was a single engine plane. Mm -hmm. Thousand horsepower, wasp engine, I guess 200 almost. I forget the. I never did know its top speed, somewhere around 200. Well, look, looking back, Jack, on, on, on Pearl Harbor, I mean, that was a very significant event. Yes. Was it reminiscent at all of what happened six years ago in New York City when the planes hit the tower? Were your thoughts at all back at Pearl Harbor when all that happened? Well, uh, when I uh, turned the television on, I didn't know what was happening. That day, I didn't know what was happening in New York City. But uh, I can still see the TV with those towers as skyscrapers burning and I thought right away of Pearl Harbor and what a mess and then as I continued to watch um, it was worse than Pearl Harbor almost you know you'd see um, say the smoke and the building collapsing and guys getting killed um, you know injured people there wasn't, when I looked, it was almost instantaneously thinking of Pearl Harbor. Well, it shows us that we're pretty vulnerable all the time, I guess. I mean, I don't know how you would ward off an attack like what happened in Pearl Harbor was unexpected. Nobody knew it, right? Oh, yes, they did, too. Did they? Who, who well, um, you know, the Japanese had sent their ambassadors over to um, to remove some of the um, what do you I can't think of it I'm having memory problems it's okay um, we had a a band um, it's like they're doing for uh, Iran now where they couldn't get some supplies, and I can't think of the word. Okay. But they were trying to uh, to grow, and so they sent some ambassadors over to try to get what they want and remove some of the um, things that prevented them from having a good life. I can't think of it. It makes me so angry. you're saying that we had um, been warned? Well, yes, we'd been warned. It, um, that there might be an attack? Yes, but we didn't know about it. But, uh, you know, after it was all over and years had passed away, um, some of the confidential um, things that happened were released and we could read about it. Mm -hmm. But at that time, at Ford Island, there would be PBYs uh, coming through that was um, being purchased by the Dutch. Um, we had some Americans that were uh, flying for the Chinese. Um, there was a lot of indications that something was about to happen. Now, what, what branch of the military? Are you the Air Corps or the...? No, I was in the Navy. Navy, so you're part of the Navy, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And these, these single engine, they're, you call them dive bombers? The dive bombers. So they come in and they drop... Straight down. Bomb? Well, no, we had a 500-pound bomb under the fuselage, and we had... Uh, we could carry two 200-pound uh, bombs under the wings. So that one or attacks, that was it, a 500-pound bomb, and 
and two two hundreds or two one hundreds under each wing or one two hundred. Was it chaotic on the ground on June, uh, December seventh when you landed? Was there a lot of chaos going on, or was it pretty organized? It was chaotic, uh, but I wasn't in the midst of it. You know, I uh, they were taking care of the wounded and I was taking care of my airplane and staying with it uh, to fire at them if they attacked again. Looking back in history, I mean, pretty significant event, Pearl Harbor. Yes. Yeah. Um, and after we had reprovisioned the ship and went out, we were the Enterprise and the Lexington, I think it was the Lexington, was the only two carriers in the Pacific. And we were patrolling the Pacific between Hawaii and Wake Island and that area of the ocean. Um, so we were removed from what was happening back at Pearl Harbor. And when we came back, to uh, Oahu, uh, let's say towards the end of January, uh, we refueled and reprovisioned the ship and went back out and we attacked Wake on the 28th of November. No, no, I'm sorry. We attacked Wake on uh, January, February 1st, I think it was. Towards the end of January, anyhow. No, that was the Marshalls. Marshall. Uh, towards the end of January, and uh, we made uh, Hilton and I made two attacks that day on the, on two of the islands. We had attacked the Marshalls, and uh, we had lost I don't know four or five planes that morning. And we flew back to the ship and when we got back there was a, about four or five other SBDs. So we were refueled and rearmed and sent back out to Bowman, another island, I can't think of the name of them. Uh, and we come back from that and uh, as, uh, as we were cruising on a course for return home, a couple of uh, Japanese bombers uh, had located us and was going to bomb us. And uh, our fighter squadron shot, shot them down. But one of them was just injured and he tried to crash on his ship and uh, he didn't make it, but it, he hit, his wing hit the ship and he went in the ocean. Um, a guy aboard ship, a machinist made third class, had jumped into one of the airplanes that was spotted on the deck and was firing at him as he came in with a machine gun. And uh, his wing had clipped the tail of that SBD off just after where he was, and he didn't even know what happened. Uh, so anyhow, we attacked the marshals at the uh, 1st of February, and then we headed, come back to uh, reprovision and took off again, and we attacked Wake Island on the 26th of February. Uh, and then uh, on the 4th of March, we attacked Marcus Island, and that's where Hilton and I were hit by AA and had a ditch. And we were taken prisoner, and, uh, and we stayed on the, on the island for about a week. And uh, they directed uh, one of the uh, ships to pick us up and take us back to Japan. And when we were in, when we arrived in Tokyo, they sent us to Yokohama, 
and we were quartered in the home of a former uh, Standard Oil representative's house. So we had some magazines to read while we were there, and they questioned us while we were there. This, this whole thing about Pearl Harbor, you were in the air on the 7th of December. Right. And that one transmission on the radio was the last thing you heard. And then you, how long were you in the air before you landed actually then? Were you still up there for a while? Or? I would say, you know, between uh, 30 minutes and an hour and you before that. we attempted to land. And tell me again, Jack, at what point did you realize there was an attack going on right then? Right then, yes. You know, it became, as soon as, you know, we saw the smoke, but, but when we neared the island, we could see the end of the second attack, you know. So we, we knew, you know, something happened. And when we had rendezvoused with the, with the three planes that were circling off Barbara's Point, it was the executive officer who had and he was second in command in our squadron. So we stayed with him uh, because a dive bomber couldn't compete with a fighter. So it was useless for us to get engaged. Uh, um, you know, to, to make up your mind to attack uh, uh, someone who was in better equipment than you were in was stupid. So, but if you were attacked by a fighter, you're going to fire back. Yeah. But you didn't see any Japanese planes. None. And you were you said you saw the end of the second attack. How long do you think the first and the second attack lasted? Do you know? I have no idea. What What do you think was the reason for the attack from Japan, and what do you think their goal was to accomplish that day? Um, as I told you, uh, the Enterprise was supposed to return to Pearl Harbor on the 6th. So the Japanese intelligence knew that. And so when the ship arrived and was tied up at the pier on the 7th, it would be tied up to the pier and um, there wouldn't it wouldn't be capable of um, defending itself. So that, that's the reason it happened on the 7th. And we were lucky that we had to refuel a destroyer and that we had to slow down because of the weather. So they, do you think so, they expected the Enterprise to be there? Yes, tomorrow? their intelligence knew it was going to be there. Now, they, was the Arizona there? Did it get sunk or damaged? Yes. Yeah. You know, if they're going to attack, uh, they're going to attack as many ships as they could, you know, get. So what was their objective? To, dis to cripple our Navy? Or, I mean, what was the I think, for one thing, the objective was uh, the Enterprise. Because if they could get the Enterprise, they wouldn't have a carrier out scouting around, finding out what they were doing. There, weren't there th several thousand casualties that day? Oh. Um, Do you have a count? Or? I don't know. There was, I don't know how many. 3,000 or so maybe? I think there was 2,200 on the Arizona alone, but I'm not sure about that. I'm, those figures are getting fuzzy in my okay. mind. So wasn't it the fact that they, they, they woke the sleeping giant? Is that how it was rephrased, rephrased as the Americans? We woke up that day or whatever? Oh, uh, 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 yes. Yeah. And from that point on, we... we oh, I think it was uh, one of the Japanese admirals that said that. Uh, they had woken up a Well, and the, the war in Europe was going on, the, now we're fighting the Japanese, that's quite a, quite a feat. Um, 
Yes, but, you know, Hitler was gaining strength and get, taking one country after another. And we, somehow, uh, I thought that we'd be in, you know, in the war too. But it was, we were in the Pacific and all that was happening in the Atlantic and it was far away from us. Um, it was distant and uh, so it wasn't, you know, too much in our minds. What was the hardest combat you ever experienced in World War II? I didn't have any. Okay. So you didn't get uh, any? The only uh, combat that stands out as our attack on the Marshall Islands. Okay. Oh. Do, do, you, do you think our country's forgetting about what happened during World War II? No, I don't think they're forgetting it, but it's not uppermost in their mind, you know. Uh, Iraq has turned out to be the wrong thing to do. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the President Bush <laughs> because, uh, you know, he's going to get bad news the rest of his life for declaring war in Iraq and what has happened. Well, what do you think about World War II? What, 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 what should Americans remember about World War II? They should remember all the... Uh, the guys that died at, um, at Beach Anzio, um, how they lost, I don't know, 15 or 1,000 men in one day and, and in just a couple of hours. And right now in Iraq, they're approaching 4,000 in five years. So I don't think. Um, that the loss of life for Iraq is not too great when you compare it to the losses in Anzio and uh, some of the other attacks we made in Europe and Africa, right. Right. Italy. Um, let me ask you this question. As, as a World War II veteran and an American citizen, Jack, what does freedom mean to you? Tell me about what freedom means to you. Freedom uh, means to me that I can do anything I want, so long as I don't hurt somebody else, someone else. And I've enjoyed that. Uh, being a prisoner of war, makes me appreciate being free all the more because of the of the power of another human being can have over you and deprive you of you can't do anything uh, if it doesn't if it's not in agreement with whoever is in charge how long were you a POW? Three and a half years. Three and a half years? Yeah. And where were you again when you were a POW? Where were you again? Um, originally, we were taken to, um, you know, uh, the Standard Oil rep's house. And from there, we went to uh, another small camp. So tell me again how you were captured. Where were you? What happened when you were captured again? We were hit by AA attacking Marcus Island, and uh, it hit our outboard fuel tank and set it on fire, and we had to ditch. And I got out the rubber boat and we're paddling around, uh, trying to get away from the island when a Japanese soldier patrolling on the on the wall that was by the beach um, saw us and they sent a small launch out to pick us up. Now did you ditch in the plane? Did you crash land in the plane or jump out? 
We crash landed. Well, what's that like? To t tell me about the crash. Uh, it was one of the smoothest landings I've ever had. Uh, you know, it, the sea wasn't too too wild that morning, not too rough. And uh, Hilton set it down between two waves, and it was calm water. And so were you fearful for your life, or did you figure you'd get out of this? Well, I was fearful for my life because when Hilton was flying it, I thought, oh, God, geez, please let it be quick. Yeah. So you both survived. We both survived. You were picked up by the Japanese, and then were you interrogated, tortured? What happened? Um, we were interrogated uh, briefly uh, and upon... Uh, getting off the launch and they took us to the, to a place where they had meetings and we were soaking wet sitting on the ground and the captain of the island couldn't speak English but he had one of his lieutenants who could and the lieutenant says if you do not he spoke to the lieutenant and the lieutenant said to us if you do not answer my questions truthfully I will kill you so they asked, they didn't ask Hilton anything, they questioned me. And they asked me what ship I was on, and I told them the Yorktown, because the last I knew the Yorktown was in the Atlantic Ocean, not the Pacific. I forget all the questions, but I didn't tell them the truth. So you weren't fearful of being killed, or? No. Why is that? I expected it. I didn't think that I would be living much longer. And, and I you, thought, what's the use of telling them the truth? So they, they questioned you, then they, they three, I mean, three and a half years, did you give up hope? Was it, was it a bad, were you, you No, because uh, we had access, um, I can't think of the first camp we went to, and then they, they sent us down to Zensuji, which was an old army Japanese army post and we stayed there for about three months and they sent us to Osaka and we were it was uh, spring when we went there and we were there all summer long spring and summer and while they had built a camp for us down by the waterfront and uh, from that camp we could uh, they could take us out to unload ships, and uh, we were in a good position to work in steel mills and things like that. So it wasn't a big, it wasn't like a concentration camp or you were deprived of food? Well, in a way it was a concentration camp, yeah. Uh, How did that change you as a person, to go through that experience? I don't know. You come out of there appreciating life? Well, you appreciate life, but every day you wonder if this is going to be the day you get killed. And living with that fear is pretty rough. And you think, why should I do this? You know, why, why fight to survive? But on the other hand, uh, after a while, uh, you get to say that I'm going to do the best I can to survive for as long as I can. What they do to me, I can't control. But I'm going to steal as much food as I can get so I can survive. Because eventually, you know, our forces will win. Did you lose anybody you knew, friends, that, were, that died during that time? Um, I had one fellow that uh, was off the Yorktown and had been captured when, when we attacked the Marshals. And uh, we were friends 
throughout prison camp. And we've corresponded when we got back to the States. And then I had another one who was a radio man off of uh, Guam, and uh, he didn't make it. He died. Were the living conditions tolerable, or were they uh, uh, untolerable? They were tolerable. tolerable. Mm -hmm. uh, the camp that I was in uh, was under control of the Japanese army, and the colonel in charge had been in China. And he didn't uh, believe too much in killing people. And he was easy with us compared to what happened in other camps. And he, he did what he sh should do as, a, as an army colonel. And uh, he did the best he could to be humane while he obeyed orders. Tell me about a normal day, what you ate, what kind of activities you had. Um, oh, I forget, our wake up time was about five o'clock in the morning. Um, and we'd get a, a cup of rice and some soup with, with cabbage leaves or something like that in it until for the first six months of the war, and then it was rough. Uh, I'm having memory problems. What year were you uh, captured? 43? 42. To, so you were a prisoner until the end of the war? Yes. Well, tell me about being liberated. When you were let go, where were you and what happened? Um, I was in a, our camp in Osaka uh, had been bombed by 800 bomb bombers on the 1st of June, 1945. Um, it took about a week for them to uh, get us to another camp on, on the western side of Japan to a place called Toyama, and there we unloaded ships. And, uh, was it a great day when you were liberated, or you knew it was coming? Yeah, I mean, we were uh, supposed to go out to unload a, a ship that had rice with it on it. Um, so we marched out to the wharf where the ship was, but they didn't put us aboard that ship. They put us aboard a ship that was empty, and they had removed the hatch covers on, on the forward hatch and told us it was empty and they told us to go all the way down. It was about, I don't know, five or six decks. And we were down at the bottom of that ship. And when all of us had got in there, they put the covers back on the hatch and covered it with canvas. And we were scared that I thought, you know, our time had come. But then all at once we heard a loud voice and it had gone, gone on for quite a while, I guess five or six minutes continually. So one of the guys climbed up the ladder and pushed the edge of the hatch up and come back down. And he told us that all the Japanese were on their knees, bowing in front of the speaker, and uh, uh, it was the emperor. Yeah. And the war was going to be over pretty quick. And we told him, um, baloney. So another guy went up and did the same thing. And he said, yes, they're going to surrender. So shortly after that, uh, the Japanese took the covers off the the hatch and told us to come back up. And when we got back up, they told us we weren't going to work anymore. And took us back to camp. And we asked them if the, you know, the Japanese had surrendered and they wouldn't answer us. 
Are you proud that you're a World War II veteran? Yes. Um, you know, I think, you know, I did the best I could to defend the, uh, the ideals that we enjoy. What, what does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Freedom. Happiness. You can do what you want, so long as you don't hurt someone else. Do you think our country, though, is forgetting about what you guys fought for? Or are we losing what you guys fought for in World War II? Well, you know, that's difficult to answer. Um, um, Saddam Hussein uh, was inhuman. But to To rid the world of someone like that isn't easy. You know? I dread China, you know? China and Russia. Russia's doing some wild things. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. At the end of my interviews, I ask the veterans to give me a salute into the camera. Mm -hmm. When I ask you from where you're seated, will you do that for me? Yeah. Well, yeah. I want you to give me a salute in the camera when I tell you to. Okay. Okay. Okay, Jack, right in the camera. Go ahead. Great, thank you.